Okay, welcome to another counter-hegemonic chat. And today we have famous historian, Dr. Gary Foley, whose speciality has been looking at the roots of Aboriginal activism and Aboriginal rights in this country. And we're gonna talk about Black, right, Black Lives Matter and Aboriginal deaths in custody today. But because Gary's speciality is in the history of all of this, I wanna start off by asking, um, the links between the US and Australia. Now, it's something that you spend a lot of time writing about, but it always fascinates me because on the one hand, the histories are very different. On the other hand, there's always been these parallels in there. So can you open up by saying something about the, the, the US-Australian links in terms of um, Black Lives Matter and uh, Aboriginal activism and what you see as the, the parallels and the differences there? Well, the um, political links go back to uh, almost to the turn of the 20th century, um, 1908, set 1900 and 1907. Um, Jack Johnson visited Australia and, and was um, viewed boxer, as an famous boxer, the first uh, black heavyweight champion of the world, uh, which he was at a time when. Um, all of the Western nations had delusions about uh, white supremacy and uh, Jack Johnson seemed to have disrupted some of their theories. But um, in terms of Australia, Jack Johnson visited Australia and made, uh, uh, fought one of his most famous fights with Tommy Burns at the Sydney Stadium in 1908. And in the crowd were a couple of Aboriginal guys who were uh, inspired by um, meeting uh, Jack Johnson and uh, later, uh, as a result of their continuing association with Aboriginal, with, uh, sorry, West Indian, African, African-American sailors passing through the Port of Sydney, um, became exposed to the ideas of Marcus Garvey, which they saw as having uh, direct uh, reference to the situation that Aboriginal people were in, in Australia at the time as a colonised people and an oppressed black uh, peoples. And... Uh, from that, uh, developed their own um, political ideas um, based upon a lot of what uh, Marcus Garvey had to say about self-determination and economic and political independence. So the first modern Aboriginal political organisation was set up in 1924, and that's the first uh, significant engagement between uh, Aboriginal activists in Australia and uh, uh, the political ideas of uh, self-determination and uh, economic and political independence from internationally. The next uh, engagement is the area of particular interest today because um, the 1960s saw what they called the, the winds of change blowing through the colonised nations, in particular Africa. Many of these nations were becoming independent. There was um, extraordinary events happening in the United States, the assassination of Martin Luther King and others. Um, there were great upheavals in black communities in America. There was the Vietnam War um, having a corrosive effect on uh, the politics of uh, the United States. Um, and uh, in Australia, there was a huge anti-war movement. Uh, the Communist Party was still going, uh, going fairly strong at that point in time. There were certain sections of the trade union movement that were extremely progressive. Um, there was a, an emerging black power movement in Australia, again, uh, in part uh, inspired by events in Oakland, California. Um, and the really interesting thing in the late 1960s, early 1970s also, the big international issue was apartheid. And so in Australia, there was a growing anti-apartheid movement comprised almost exclusively of non, uh, I mean, exclusive white Australians who were challenged in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, uh, and uh, had it put to them by Paul Coe that uh, unless they also demonstrated in such large numbers uh, on the issue of black rights in Australia, then uh, they would be regarded as hypocrites. So towards the end of the 60s, there came this convergence of all of these strong uh, political movements um, and the issue of the day that had in, had in fact triggered the Australian version of the Black Power Movement in Redfern uh, 
uh, the issue was police brutality, police harassment of Aboriginal people in the streets of Redfern. And it was uh, the determination of a young group of uh, activists in Redfern who decided to take on the police that led to uh, a dramatic nationwide pan-Aboriginal upheaval in the late 60s, early 70s. Now, uh, the really interesting thing about the times we're living in now, I see similar convergences in the context of a, uh, an international health scare, which uh, is creating all sorts of extraordinary possibilities, and extraordinary, um, you know, it would be really amazing to see what, what comes of all this. And in, in the middle of that health scare, we had another racist police murder in the US, that of George Floyd, and that sparked uh, rallies around the world. But in this country, it immediately switched onto the topic of Aboriginal deaths in custody. Well, it was inevitably going to be so. I mean, the issues are so, you know, again, it's one of those moments in history, again, where the parallels are just unbelievable. Um, you know, the issue of uh, police brutality, despite the creation of uh, Aboriginal legal services in the early 1970s, the issue of police brutality has always been there. You know, and um, the thing that underpins or, if you like, uh, motivates a lot of the police brutality is the extraordinary depth of racism uh, that exists uh, not only throughout the broader society but uh, institutionalised in, in many, most, well, the Royal Commission found that institutional racism in the criminal justice system was the primary reason Aboriginal people were being in jail in such numbers 30 years ago. Nothing has changed. And so when things don't change, as in America, you know, African-American people have been uh, rioting, if you like, burning down uh, uh, neighbourhoods and um, uh, trying to draw attention to police brutality ever since I can remember, you know, uh, and yet nothing has changed. And, and it's the same uh, situation here. I mean, you know, the other interesting thing about these days is if you look at footage of uh, the police when they smashed the Aboriginal Embassy in 1972, it's really interesting to compare the manner of dress of the, the police uh, back in 1972. There was nobody carrying guns. There was nobody carrying tasers. There was nobody carrying pepper sprays. There was nobody dressed like they were going to war in Afghanistan. You know, and the military, it, it really emphasises the extent to which the police have become militarised in the, you know, the last 50 years and almost without sort of anyone in the broader Australian society really worrying about that much, you know, and every single premier of every single political party in this country in the last 50 years is guilty of jumping on the bandwagon of law and order every election time, you know. The drumbeat starts from the police union, the politicians uh, jump into line and get into order and march to that beat. And increasingly, as you know, in the last 50 years, we've seen a gradual but but amazing militarisation of, uh, of the police forces in Australia and in America. Now, in this country, um, the uh, we talk about racism, but there isn't any other ethnic group let's say migrants or Indians or anyone else that's come to this country that's got anything like the over-policing, the over-arrest, the over-imprisonment of Aboriginal people. Why is there that big difference? Because people sometimes think it's, well, it's to do with colour, but no, it's to do with in indigeneity, isn't it? Why is it that you haven't got the same racism against other uh, different ethnic groups that you have with Indigenous people in this country? It's probably a <laughs> great national guilty conscience. Um, I think it's historical. It, it, you know, Aboriginal people were regarded as subhuman when the British first came here. Uh, when they realised they couldn't um, just uh, slaughter us as they had started out uh, doing, um, they switched their tactics and they thought, well, they're an inferior race. We'll uh, breed them out with uh, policies of assimilation, you know, uh, born of eugenics. Um, and those sort of policies existed right up until the 1970s. And from that day to this and from the beginning of uh, the occupation of our country, Aboriginal people have always been the most powerless in this society. And, uh, but there's some other aspect to the mentality of racism against Aboriginal people. It's a really, of a really brutal sort. Uh, 
and a recent um, survey, a recent uh, study has shown that uh, more than 75% of Australians harbour deep um, um, antipathy towards Aboriginal people. Now, I would argue that that's partly because of the generational uh, indoctrination that Australians have been put through to the extent that virtually no Australian who comes out of an Australian high school today knows anything about Australian history. I mean, I teach Australian history. I teach Australian history to young white kids who say to me at the end of the semester, how come I wasn't taught that in school? You know, what's the problem with teaching that in school? It would have been better that I knew this stuff when I was going to school, you know, to give me a better chance of understanding uh, better now that I'm at university. So it's a, it's a range of complex things, but you're right in terms of every, uh, every group that's ever come here, uh, despite uh, some of the appalling treatments some of them have got, uh, still, aren't, still have ended up in a far better situation than the Aboriginal people. Now, you mentioned eugenics there, and I just wonder, it's, I know it's something you've studied also. Can you just give us a background to the Australian context of that? There were some striking figures, I think, and some in Melbourne, including, but, and as you say, it went on into the 70s. Can you just say exactly a little bit about, you know, the eugenics movement or society in this country and what they were about? Well, in Melbourne, um, when I was going to Melbourne Uni uh, at the turn of this century, um, Melbourne Uni... Virtually every building in the place was named after prominent uh, colonial or early Melbourne figures who were part of the establishment, part of the university, part of uh, the Melbourne Museum, part of the Melbourne Zoological Society. These are, the, these are bodies that emerged out of the old colonial movement and somehow uh, in the late 19th century, this idea, some of the ideas of eugenics uh, were seen to be um, uh, uh, useful. Uh, well, for a start, eugenics for Australia by storm in the second part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century. Um, and some of the most ardent supporters of the ideas of eugenics uh, were people like Baldwin Spencer. I mean, uh, 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 just, uh, just about every eminent person who's got a building named after Melbourne University. Every member of the uh, Melbourne establishment, Sir Redmond Barry, who hung Ned Kelly, uh, but who earlier in his career had defended the first two, Aborig first two men ever hanged in Melbourne, two Aboriginal guys from Tasmania. But um, eugenics, um, eugenics was seen as the perfect solution, the final solution, if you like, for the so-called Aboriginal problem, what was perceived as the Aboriginal problem. The Aboriginal people had not died out like um, the, the uh, theories had suggested they would, what, having come into contact with British civilization, And so there was this uh, remaining problem. And among this remaining problem was a, 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 an embarrassing number of, uh, in, an embarrassingly large number of uh, part Aboriginal children uh, who in those days could only have uh, been created in one way, and that is by white men having sex with Aboriginal women, which was... Uh, you know, uh, completely, de you know, denied and covered up. And in order to hush this up, they they took the, took all, took a lot of those children, uh, placed them in homes, and tried to have them farmed out to white families, so that the any any part of Aboriginality in them could be bred out. You know, because it would be expected that those kids would then marry white people, and a couple of generations along, uh, no more Aborigines. Uh, and with the remaining Aborigines, they had to round them up. Uh, confine them to uh, well, what could only be described as concentration camps, the Aboriginal reserves in New South Wales and Queensland and Western Australia. Um, and whilst they were under the control of government and Christian missionaries, um, the whole sort of uh, drumbeat of uh, assimilation was banged into them. You know, uh, it was a deliberate uh, major social engineering um, uh, effort uh, based on the ideas of eugenics uh, with, the, with the desired end result being that in the long term there would be no Aborigines. It was a long-term way of trying to do what Hitler tried to do in a very quick time. Now this is linked in a way, isn't it, to the scientific approach to race and theories of race and racism to 
what the anthropologists were doing. I know you were a senior curator at the Australian Museum in Melbourne, mm. um, what, 20 years ago or something, was it? And yeah. that museum had an enormous number of body parts and was supplemented by uh, some that came from, was it the anthropology section of Melbourne University? What was well, going I mean, on? As, as part of uh, the um, enthusiasm for eugenics around the time that the Melbourne University was created, um, the first, uh, one of their first uh, professors of anatomy was Professor Richard Berry, who was probably, up until the 1930s even, the most ardent, um, um, not only ardent advocate of eugenics, he actually said that eugenics formed the most important part of his work. Not only that, he was uh, probably as a result of that, he became the, the biggest collector of Aboriginal skulls ever in Australian history. And uh, when I started studying at Melbourne University, it uh, came to my attention that there, somebody had told me that there were still some of these of Richard Berry collection held within the uh, anatomy department at Melbourne Uni. And so I, being the kind of guy I am, I made some inquiries and I discovered, in fact, that there were more than 300 uh, skulls and other skulls so-called skeletal remains of Aboriginal people uh, held by the, um, um, the anatomy department. Um, I was able to go to the Vice Chancellor of Melbourne Uni at the time as a first year student, but also as the senior curator for South Southeastern Australia at the, at the Melbourne Museum. And I uh, had the authority to sign permits allowing people to retain collections of uh, Aboriginal human remains uh, under the Victorian uh, law that had been changed 10 years previous, previously. And uh, I knew that uh, Melbourne Uni's retention of these remains was illegal. In fact, I was able to go to the Vice Chancellor of Melbourne Uni at the time and put it to him that I was in a position to have him arrested unless those items were returned henceforth. Um, um, and he freaked out naturally, but he conducted an audit of the entire university as a result of that and he found that not only were there 300 items as part of the berry collection but there was also a considerable number of other items of various description scattered throughout other departments within the university and we managed to get that all of that material returned and i mean it's at the time it's got to be said in around about 2000 in the year 2000 the melbourne museum was at the forefront in in the world in terms of um, its dealings with Aboriginal people, especially in terms of uh, human remains and secret and sacred objects. And the uh, Melbourne Museum was very progressive in terms of its repatriation policies, right up until a certain moment when it became inconvenient and the, Mel uh, <laughs> the British Museum uh, entered into the equation. Before we get to that, you were um, uh, you did repatriate some of the remains to families, I think. Well, I mean, we had an active policy of uh, uh, where we were able to sort of, I mean, some of these, the really terrible thing that had happened during Richard Berry's years in his um, quest to collect Aboriginal remains and skulls in particular, uh, he wasn't particularly fussy about where they came from. And uh, as a result, uh, because there was such a worldwide market amongst anthropologists and archaeologists around the world at the time, they were starting to run short down here. So uh, there was a notorious case where um, some people, you know, there were collectors going from Melbourne up and wandering around uh, in Aboriginal cemeteries along the Murray River. And probably the most notorious case was a, uh, a Melbourne... Um, person who who not only went up uh, digging up freshly dug Aboriginal graves, he used to go to people's funerals and keep an eye out for um, potentially good specimens and uh, who were likely to die in the near future. And he would uh, go to their funerals when he saw that they'd died, uh, wait a, a respectable time, like a couple of months, and then go and dig them up. And we found that... Uh, as we were repatriating some of the human remains, there were actually remains 
that with the great grandparents and grandparents of people living in the Aboriginal community in Melbourne. So it's a pretty shocking uh, state of affairs that existed, and it all it all devolves back to this uh, lunatic idea of James Corden's eugenics. You know, um, um, Charles Darwin's cousin, although you know Dalton perverted the ideas of uh, uh, Darwin. But it was Dalton who was responsible for this, not only happening here, but also in the United States and Canada and other parts of the world, where these sort of ideas of uh, eugenics, how, you, how the white race could uh, prevail through these notions of eugenics by ridding the world of um, inferior specimens. Now, you mentioned that guy, Richard Berry, who I think he went to England uh, in the 30s or something, but eugenics carried on in this country, didn't it? I think. There was a chief justice and perhaps a governor of Victoria much later on. Um, can you tell us how how well, late eugenics kept going? Well, I think there's people out there today who you know, there probably is a eugenic society out there today. These sort of ideas die hard, and you know there's always going to be a fringe element. It's just that unfortunately during the late 19th and early 20th century, it wasn't a fringe movement. It mushroomed into a a very big and strong and powerful and influential movement, especially in the United States, but also here as well. Now, going back to this question of racism and indigeneity here, we've got, uh, you know, what is it now, 14 times over-representation in prisons of Aboriginal people with the rest of the population. Um, and you were saying, well, you know, there is a history associated with that and it has to be a history associated with dispossession that has kept the racism against Aboriginal people far worse than any other sort of racism in this country. Um, that makes me think, always makes me think, how is it then that the parallels that were the lessons that were being, the links that were being made were with the US, with the African Americans who came from the slave history of the Americas and less so the Native Americans? Or was it to do with the militancy, militancy of the African Americans? Why was it there was such a strong connection with the Black Power Movement in the 60s, for example, and not, not so much the Native Americans? Well, in the same way as virtually nothing was being written in terms about the, the radical developments in Aboriginal Australia, there was very little that we had access to in Australia at the time about what was going on with the Native Americans. The links between the Native Americans and us um, developed fairly early in the in the 70s when um, the, the founder of the Native American Rights Fund, an amazing guy called John E. Everhall, came out and spent some time with us activists here and that began, that was the beginning of a long sort of historical range of links that culminated with me, I suppose, meeting um, Russell Means uh, about three or four years ago in Adelaide. Um, but the African American, the other thing that, that probably made us more conscious of the situation of African Americans was in Sydney in the late 60s. Um, the American military were moving their troops to Sydney on RR, Rest and Recuperation from Vietnam. And uh, um, a disproportionate number of those American troops were African Americans, you know, they're being used as cannon fodder in Vietnam. And, and it was those African-Americans who were coming into Sydney in the late 60s who brought with them uh, uh, not only some of the more up-to-date uh, political literature coming out of the African-American situation, but they're also bringing first-hand uh, stories about what was going on uh, in America. And uh, so we, in, in certain ways, the Aboriginal com certain parts of the Aboriginal community in Redfern at the time were probably better informed about what was going on in in, in America, certain parts of America than, than mainstream Australians and the mainstream Australian media. So these African-American troops also had a fairly uh, big impact in terms of uh, meeting with us, talking with us, telling us what was going on, um, selling us a bit of weed here and there, bringing with us, uh, bringing with them great books and stuff that we were, we were devouring and sort of, um, and we weren't just looking at these books and thinking, well, we're going to do that. We were looking and we were reading this material and thinking to ourselves, gee, that's that's almost identical to what's going on here. But you know, let's and so we took these ideas and we we not a, not didn't just adopt them, we adapted them to our situation in Australia. And we found that you know it just so happened that 
many of the uh, community programs devised by the Black Panther Party in, in Oakland, California, uh, work pretty well in the Redfin Aboriginal community. As ideas like, well, I mean, the idea that led to the first legal service in Australia, free shop front uh, health clinics, uh, children and women's services, uh, free breakfast for children program. Uh, these were some of the ideas that we adopted and adapted from um, the, the Native American people, you know. And the Black Panthers had an impact, though. Absolutely, but so too did the American Indian Movement at, um, at Wounded Knee um, when they um, had the siege uh, at Pine Ridge, uh, took on the entire American military, you know. But also we'd uh, followed uh, what had happened in 1968 when uh, they, uh, they occupied Alcatraz in the middle of San Francisco Bay. And, you know, there's some who say, and I think it's not all that wrong, that the Aboriginal Embassy, in part, was inspired by, um, you know, the memory of the occupation of Alcatraz by the American Indian Movement. But land had uh, became, in at least by the late 60s, land and land rights became a central feature of the Aboriginal rights movement in this country. Well, I, I would argue it happened. It occurred before that because um, the Black Power Movement, uh, that came out of Redfin in the late 60s, uh, the three key things that uh, that stood for was self-determination, land rights and economic independence. And I mean, not necessarily in that order because we argued that um, if we were to have genuine self-determination in the sort of society that surrounded us now, then uh, we needed to realise that, that, that the key to freedom in this country is economic independence not as, in our case, not as um, individuals, which is what us, the broader Australian community is encouraged to do, but uh, we, because we perceive ourselves differently as uh, people who, uh, uh, if you like, for want of a better term, more of a so socialist sort of society, then we saw land as being something that could be utilised for the benefit of uh, the survivors of the, the Australian Holocaust. And it was if we were able to achieve economic independence, then we could, you know, have strive towards some de genuine degree of self-determination. But in order to um, even start to talk about economic independence, what's the first thing you're going to need if you are if you are a group of uh, landless refugees in your own land? What do you need to start uh, building towards the path towards economic independence? You need land. And so that's why land rights was um, the, the cry that came out of the, the Black Power Movement. But if you want to trace the actual land rights movement itself to its uh, proper roots, it was in the 1966 uh, walk-off by the Greenies. But then if you want to trace part of the inspiration for the 1966 walk-off by the Greenies, you go back to 1946 in the Pilbara and the pastoral strike over there by the pastoral workers there, you know. Where there was a there was a coalition and, between the unions and and yep. those workers too, the the stockmen. Well, at, at at crucial moments in the history of the black struggle, uh, there's always been uh, at least one or two. There's never been a lot, but there's always been uh, a core group of uh, either a, a good staunch trade union with a good leadership that has educated their membership and the membership. Uh, like in the when the Wolfies supported the the uh, the Gurindji with a national levy, when uh, the Builders Labourers Federation in New South Wales uh, supported us at the, at the Ten Embassy, um, they took their membership with them. You know, they, they were the they were the sort of uh, trade union leaders who weren't some of the oligarchical types that we see so much these days. Yeah. <laughs> Now, come the 80s, we've got a the resurgence of, let's say, a campaign over police brutality and killings by police and in prisons too. And you've got, you know, we, we remember, but a lot of people will not because it's a long time ago now that there was a campaign for a special inquiry into, um, into Aboriginal deaths in custody, which in this part of the world they call the Royal Commission or they called the Royal Commission back then. Mm. We got that Royal Commission. Uh, can you just outline 
what exactly was achieved um, in that Royal Commission? Well, I see the Royal Commission in the context of the fights that myself and other young people back in the 60s had. We believed when we set up our first free shop front Aboriginal legal aid centre uh, that, that this was something that was going to be able to bring about meaningful change. Uh, we were young, naive. <laughs> Um, that didn't happen. But then uh, 10 or 20 years later, um, the, uh, the mass outrage in Aboriginal communities about the numbers of increasing numbers of deaths of Aboriginal people in custody, um, that growing movement then led uh, men, you know, people uh, in the great heat of the moment, people thought that when the government had created a Royal Commission, that here at last is a chance to get at the truth. Here at last is a, uh, the possibility that uh, meaningful change will come. And a lot of people got sucked in by that. Me too. I, I include myself in that. But um, I, just after the Royal Commission was established, when Justice Jim Muirhead was the first um, uh, Chief Commissioner, of it, if that's what you call him, I had a meeting with him in Adelaide. I just happened to be in Adelaide at the time doing something else. And uh, I, ha I had a meeting with him and uh, I said to him, uh, have you assembled your um, research team? I said, there's a lot of uh, work that's going to be need to be done there. That's going to be one of the most important sort of areas of what you're going to have to do. He said, oh, yes, we've got um, our research team established. I said, oh, yeah, um, many Aboriginals on it. And he looked rather sheepishly at me and um, said, oh, we've got a black South African. And I said, well, this is not good enough, Commissioner, if you don't mind me saying. I think I might have said it in slightly stronger terms than that. But um, that led to the Commission setting up these, what they call these social, these Aboriginal um, uh, underlying issues committees to, to try and steer the uh, research team and the Royal Commission at least into looking at some of what the underlying broader historical and, um, you know, uh, issues were, you know, which was always going to be too big a job for even the most eminent uh, bunch of legal minds. But in the final analysis, the Royal Commission did come up with 334, I think it was, recommendations, uh, most of which were designed supposedly to prevent Aboriginal people dying in the jails in the numbers that they were. I mean, at the time, Aboriginal people were the most imprisoned people in Australia. Uh, the situation's even worse 30 years later. But the Royal Commission did come up with some interesting findings. It, it found that um, the reason so many Aboriginal people were, in, well, the reason so many Aboriginal people were dying in jail was because there were so many Aboriginal people in jail and that there were so many Aboriginal people in jail, not because of the inherent criminality or anything like that on the part of the Aboriginal people, but rather the Royal Commission found that the entire Australian criminal justice system, from the police to the High Court, is deeply embedded with racist attitudes towards Aboriginal people. And, uh, you know, the end of the Royal Commission um, in Victoria, uh, in a twisted, perverted sort of Monty Python sort of sense, the first group of people in Victoria to benefit from the findings of the Royal Commission were the Victoria Police and the uh, Victoria Prison Officers Association who were provided with $300,000 grants in order to conduct programs to sensitise their members. Now, um, I would uh, suggest that that those programs are pretty much of a failure. And it also happens that uh, most of the recommendations of the Royal Commission were never acted upon or by now have mostly been reversed or forgotten, you know, in the years since and with the never-ending barrage of uh, law and order campaigns every state election. Well, the uh, it was one of the central recommendations of that inquiry that they should be jailing Aboriginal people less 
but I think you have made the point in your article, White Police and Black Power. Is that one published, by the way, yet or not? Goodness gracious, did I write that? <laughs> I um, can't remember. The, the origins when was that the, written? The origins of the Aboriginal legal oh, system. No, no, I wrote that uh, for the... Um, 50th on the for the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the uh, New South Wales Aboriginal Legal Service. Uh, it's a deliberately written piece that that looks at the um, uh, historical times, the uh, all of the elements that came together that led to the creation of the legal service. Because I think it's important that people who uh, work for Aboriginal legal services these days really need to be reminded of what the origins of those organisations were, what the extent of the, the accountability that was supposed to be built in to those organisations to the communities that they uh, were working in and representing. And, you know, these those organisations were the first community-controlled organisations in Australia, and the community-control movement of Aboriginal uh, organisations was a, another uh, really important uh, uh, factor in the political situation in those times in the 70s and 80s. And uh, slowly but surely, the creeping uh, assimilationist policies, uh, you know, not overtly stated these days, but continuing to exist, have managed to create a, a new black middle class that, uh, that uh, has become part of the problem and is now, you know, part of the production of the assimilation project but we won't go there. Okay, so I'm gonna say at the end of your article that you wrote, I'll try and link it up to the video when we put the video online. You wrote at the end of a lot of historical references that the at the end of this Royal Commission in 1991, which is almost 30 years ago, there was a, you know, uh, a very high level of over-representation in prisons, but by 2017, it was much higher. Now, what's gone on here, like the, clearly at a police level where most of the damage is done um very little has changed or perhaps it's got worse yet the kids today are certainly better educated than they were in the 60s would you agree with that there's, yes there's, there's some sort of changes but what what's been the balance there if you compare the 60s to now now um what advances have there been and where has nothing changed or where have things gone backwards well, the big difference these days, and I think we're seeing that in the just how dramatically the Black Lives Matter thing has exploded in the last couple of weeks, the big difference is social media. I mean, you know, if we'd have had um, the ability to connect with each other like now, um, back in the late 1960s, we would have, we'd be running the world by now. And those kids out there probably be over on us. Um, no, I think that social media is been a big impact on on uh, young Koori's um, uh, essentially educating themselves, you know, along the way, uh, but drawing on a broad range of material that they've now got access to that we never had access to back in the old days. Um, so that's the good, uh, that's the good news. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd put the good news first, but that's the only good news there is, I think. Um, the Royal Commission again like the beginnings of the legal service which raised expectations i mean there was a fairly high level of expectation after the royal commission as well you know and there was reason to be or at least there seemed to be reason to be uh and as always when a an embarrassing report comes out government sort of line up to you know the same you know ministers mouth their platitudes and sort of say all the right things and make promises about implementing recommendations, blah, blah, blah. All of that happened. But as we now know, nothing really has changed. I mean, the other thing that's changed for the worse, like I've mentioned before, that even since the Royal Commission, um, that um, uh, uh, militari militarisation of the police mm -hmm. is, a, is a major factor, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the advent of private prisons, and also, you know, not what not a lot of people who are welded to the ALP, the Australian Labor Party, as the alternative government, what not a lot of people like to remember is that the lunatic idea, in, the most lunatic idea imported from the United States in the last 50 years, 
was the three, three strikes you're out, the mandatory sentencing laws. And those laws, which were introduced by Margaret Lawrence, Margaret Lawrence? Uh, huh? Yeah, the Western Australian Premier, yeah, whatever her name was. Wasn't Margaret. Uh, the, um, Carmen Lawrence. The, Carmen Lawrence. Yeah. The, um, the mandatory sentence and laws introduced into Australia by the then West Australian Premier Carmen Lawrence uh, and then taken up in other parts, both overtly and covertly of Australia, um, that, had a, that resulted in a dramatic increase in, in Aboriginal people and poor people going to jail. And um, if, you, if, you, if you sort of look at that also in the context of, like I said, every single state election in the last 50 years, law and order has emerged as an issue, uh, you know, spurred on by uh, the tabloids in each capital city. And the politicians uh, then get into a competition of who's tougher, who's the toughest on law and order. And every time they do that and the laws that are introduced as part, you know, as a result of those sort of campaigns are the sort of laws that put poor people and, in, you know, in particular Aboriginal people into prisons. And in order to uh, cope with this uh, dramatic influx into uh, the prison system, they then introduce these, uh, another lunatic American idea, uh, private prisons, you know, so that prisons then, you know, uh, then become dependent upon a, a, a steady flow of uh, people in order to maintain their income for their shareholders. I mean, you know, it's really perverse. Mm. So when George Floyd is murdered on camera, because there's so many cameras around these days um, in Minneapolis, it strikes a chord in this country, doesn't it? Yes, well, it struck a chord all over the world, didn't it? I mean, I must confess that I haven't watched it. I, I can't watch that sort of thing. Um, just to be, just to have it described is uh, bad enough. But um, it, it clearly, you know, when that, you know, these police um, there and here seem to have grown so drunk with their power that they, they think they're, you know, immune to any sort of accountability. Well, they, and, have been, they have been, haven't they? Exactly, and that 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 idea is developed in their heads because they've been able to. And again, the other factor that's uh, in the equation here is the police unions, both in the United States and in Australia. Um, you know, uh, well, you know, in in norm, I mean, it's it's the power of the police unions that have enabled, uh, in many ways, the police to get away with this because they know that they they're not going to be held accountable. They're, the union will stick up with them, stick up for them through right or wrong, and no matter what happens, the only thing they can expect up until now has been a slap on the wrist. And, we saw and the George thing. Floyd thing and what's going on now is all a all a complete result of uh, society allowing them to get away with it. We had a good example of that in Palm Island, didn't we? In that case where the right. young man was killed in Palm Island, and uh, yep. there were attempts to prosecute the, the the police officers that did it, and they were derailed all the way down the line. Not only that, the other thing about Palm Island, and an interesting parallel as well, the same in the United States, same here, um, peaceful, peaceful sort of uh, letter writing and, 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 you know, all of the nice way of doing things politically that conservative uh, Aboriginal leaders like to advocate uh, always changes nothing. It's only when you make a noise, you react, like Palm Island... There would have been nothing done about what happened in Palm Island had it not been for the people uh, rising up and, you know, burning down a cop shop and, you know, drawing a bit of attention to what the what was going on. The same in the United States now, you know. George Floyd's murder would probably, you know, have been just another statistic if it hadn't been for all these cameras. And that's the other good thing these days. Is car well, it's good and bad, isn't it? You know, it's good that there's plenty of cameras around there catch the coppers and what they're doing, but then it's bad when you when you think to yourself, hang on a sec, the coppers have got more cameras than us and they with artificial intelligence uh, uh, you know, they they're yeah. probably looking at us now. Once upon a time they used to target anyone with a camera at a demonstration, you know, they'd, they'd single them out because there was only yeah. a couple of them there basically. But um, yeah. but now look the the huge spark that George Floyd murder was in the US. I mean a tremendous thing which we still haven't seen the end of and I think 
I saw mm. Angela Davis the other day saying this is a, also a tremendous opportunity. Um, the, the, the follow on here or the echo here was some incredible uh, rallies, uh, much bigger than I'd expected because everyone was still in a, in a state of quarantine to a degree, just at the end of the quarantine. And they were, were you surprised at the, uh, at the rallies that sparked in this country after the murder of George Floyd? I wasn't surprised. Um, um, after recent years, uh, the big uh, numbers we've been getting at Invasion Day rallies, um, I knew that uh, that uh, sentiment was still out there and growing down here. Um, I still reckon that um, the global marches last Friday, from what I could see, uh, reports coming out of Europe, uh, Britain and America, the Melbourne protest was one of the biggest in the world, you know. and uh, that's because there's a new young uh, generation coming along. Uh, the, the, they're basically the grandkids of my generation. And uh, they are kids who have grown up knowing the name of the game all their lives. They've uh, been around the likes of me and Bruce McGuinness and, and Alma Thorpe and a lot of these old people down here uh, all their lives. And they've been part of, you know, you know, and... And they are just now sort of emerging in their own right, I think. You know, they're still young. They're still uh, enthusiastic. <laughs> just are, like, they getting, are they getting an education in their own history? They wouldn't be doing what they're doing if they hadn't, mate. Um, all of the organisers of uh, the marches down here have uh, studied under me. Um, and that's all they need to do. Um, but... Apart from any um, formal educational understanding of, of the context of their own history, uh, like I say, they've lived that history. I mean, yet a lot of the stuff that people talk about now, the history of the 1990s and all this, those kids were there, you know, they were part of it, you know, and so they've got a, a really good, solid, strong grounding um, uh, personally and politically. They're very smart young people. They're virtually all women, young women. And they're tough, they're smart, and um, uh, they know what they're doing. Um, they're taking a bit of advice from some of us older heads on on minor things, but uh, they're finding their own way. They're developing their own strategy, and I I believe they're going great guns. Now, with our sceptical background with what's happened in the past with, you know, promises and, um, you know, royal commissions and so on, you would have seen some of the proposals for defunding or restructuring or reforming the police in the US. I don't know whether you uh, want to comment on any of these, but it's sort of interesting to see that they are actually seriously talking about abolition of existing police departments and also some other elements. I'd like your feedback on this. Um, well, for example, why are they they're questioning in the US openly now, and this is coming out in traditional media, you know, why is it that the police are going to um, call outs with mental health people, why are they dealing with homeless people and so on. In the US, apparently one in four fatal shootings are to do with people with mental illnesses, for example. So they've got some proposals about having different groups of people responding to uh, emergency situations like that. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the general proposals of abolishing, restructuring or reforming police in, in the US? Well, I mean, that would have to be the ideal. I mean, the ideal won't happen, but the ideal ought to be that that the, the whole rotten structure be dispensed with, rethought and start again. You know, and if that means uh, turning all these big bulky blokes into sensitive new age social workers in the long term, so be it. But it just seems to me that 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 tinkering on the edges, which has always happened in the past, and which would seem to invariably be likely to happen again um, uh, is of no use. I mean, uh, unless there's a deep overhaul of the entire idea of police and, you know, what do we want in a, what sort of society do you want to live in? And it, it, if we are to have some sort of people to, to you know, catch uh, bank robbers or something, although there's not many bank robbers these days, um, then we... We just have a small group of people who are not part of a private uh, company, but who are, who are 
you know, accountable to government and people. But accountability at the end of the day has got to be the go. But how that um, can be achieved, who knows? But, I mean, we are in a really interesting moment. I mean, this pandemic has uh, provided that just that little bit extra that was that makes this whole scenario, you know, scenario what's going on now, just so, you know, open to all sorts of possibilities, you know. Now, what about the resistance in this in this context? I mean, the people who are out there demanding changes, for example, um, and you know, the to the does it strike you that the level of organisation of that resistance is important, you know, because of course there are these powerful forces that are going to come along and capture any new issue out there and turn it to their own ends, basically. And you mentioned that in terms of police unions and so on, getting retooled and you know, you know, sensitivity training mm. and all the rest of it, all those sorts of upgrades. What about the organisation of the resistance in this country? What do you see going on there? Well, I mean, whilst a moment ago I was praising um, the new thing of social media, um, I think that the one of the negative effects that social media seems to be having is the fracturing of um, the possibilities of a, uh, a national unity thing. There's also... Um, the, I mean, the important thing to remember about the Aboriginal movement back in the 70s and why the Aboriginal embassy became the iconic moment of the black resistance in the 20th century uh, was because we built a movement that was a pan-Aboriginal movement, you know. We identified nationally as a, a mob, you know, and we all knew who we was and where we come from, but that wasn't uh, the, the primary allegiance that we held and that was you know it's the old thing you know the oldest thing in the book unity makes you strong and uh, we had a nationally unified uh, political movement with uh, alliances with other strong uh, movements of the time and that that made for possibilities you know it that's the sort of it's that sort of strength in numbers and good strong alliances and good organisation in your own mob that that makes the difference, and that's yet to be seen about what can happen with these young ones. Because I suspect that um, social media also has a isolating effect, so that you know people become more into themselves than their phone and their little gaggle of friends. Mm. Uh, but you know, I might be being overly pessimistic. After yeah, all. There was a coalition in the eighties. There was a national coalition in the eighties. What happened there? Well, again, you know, I think the two words are Hawke Keating, or oh, three words, the AL, the Australian Labor Party, uh, again, come along and, um, you know, subverted those who it could, uh, co-opted those who it could, uh, undermined and, and destroyed those who it couldn't. I mean, I, as you, I think, know, in the early days when I first started my, writing my PhD 20 years ago, yeah, I had in mind as a title, when your best friends are your worst enemies. And I had particularly in mind when I was thinking about that title, um, the um, Australian Labor Party, because I, it's my contention that um, the, uh, the Australian Labor Party since the 1960s has done as much, if not more, damage to us than anything the Conservatives have done. If, in fact, if anything, it's worse with the Labor Party because a lot of people out there perceive the Labor Party to be somehow empathetic or sympathetic to the Aboriginal cause, which it most certainly is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, remember, it was the, it was the Hawke, Hawke government in collusion with the corrupt, and I'm not using my words loosely here, the man went to jail for corruption, the corrupt Premier of Western Australia, Brian Burke, who at the time was the national president of the ALP, those two gentlemen, Bob Hawke, the Prime Minister, and Brian Burke effectively killed Aboriginal land rights when, uh, Bob, when Brian Burke talked Bob Hawke out of his proposed national uniform land rights legislation. Hawke became Prime Minister promising us national 
uniform land rights legislation along the lines of the 1976 Northern Territory Act, which meant freehold title, uh, the right to refuse uh, the right to uh, mine on Aboriginal land. A whole ra range of things were promised. One meeting with Brian Burke, you know, a corrupt uh, agent for West Australian mining and pastoral interests and Premier of Western Australia and National President of the ALP. And people wonder why we have, we should have faith, you know, wonder why I say we've got, we should have no faith in any of the political parties in existence in Australia at the moment. But you have some faith in young people, it seems. Well, I'm hoping that um, they will see the light a lot earlier in the life than what I did. Unfortunately, I won't be here when they see it, but I know that some of them will see it. And when they do, I hope they, they're not like me. They see the light and they look around, oh, where is everyone? They're all dead, all my comrades. <laughs> Jagged folks. Well, on that happy note, thanks for your time, Gary. Thank we'll you, Tim, as we'll always.